Good afternoon. When I was invited to give a talk here by Charlie, I th my first thought was, I don't belong there. I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have money. Um, I'm in the business of teaching. But then I thought again, well, yes, I am in the business of teaching. And I teach physics. And as such, I like to entertain the idea that I teach big ideas. And so what I would like to do today in the 10 minutes that I have is to talk about one big idea. Now, I'm not much of a speaker. I've never this, done this kind of a speech. So what, I'd like, what I thought I would do is to actually speak about what I do and what we, what we work to discover. And then based on that idea, in part to you, two notions. One, there's actually a lot of good stuff happening in Detroit, in particular at Wayne State University. And two, yay. And two, there are big ideas that sometimes we lose sight of. And perhaps you don't, perhaps you do. And if you do, I want to remind you of that big idea. But I'll keep that for the last slide. OK, so I'm going to talk about what I do. The perfect liquid. So I can see your mind working. Starbucks. <laughs> I do love a latte. In fact, I'm addicted. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, your next thought is, hmm, beer. It's not happening. Beer. But I'm not going to talk about that either. It's, it's, a, it's a great liquid. I love it. How about wine? Yeah, I'm an intellectual, so we, we drink wine, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that either. I'm going to talk about something absolutely obscure, something, something you probably never heard of, a quark gluon plasma. Yeah. <laughs> so now I can hear you think. What the hell is that? <laughs> well, to tell you about a quark gluon plasma, I have to bring you back in history. And we'll do this very quick, because we don't have a lot of time. I have to remind you of what we're made of. And what we're made of was discovered through the 20th century by amazing thinkers, amazing people, men and women, who spend their lives trying to understand what the stuff we are made of is, what, what is the nature of things. And in a nutshell, it's here. We're made of atoms. Atoms have a nucleus. This was discovered by Ernest Rutherford. It's a tiny nucleus. But it doesn't stop there. Nucleus are made of protons and neutrons. And you think you're done. We're not. There's actually a sub-constituency to protons and neutrons, and we call them quarks. And talking about quarks is what I'm going to do today. Wow, I must be crazy. OK. So skipping through 50 years of research in particle physics and nuclear physics, I can give you, in a nutshell, the picture we have of everything there is to know about today. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm not going to talk about dark matter. If some of you would like to talk about it, come and see me afterward. <laughs> so today we know that everything we know around us, all the matter around us, can be decomposed in these simple tables. In other words, everything is made of quarks and leptons. You're familiar with electrons. You're familiar with protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made of these quarks, up and down quarks. OK. As it happens, I have never seen a quark. Never. None of my colleagues, and I have thousands of them working in the same field, none of them have seen quarks, ever. And we have a, an explanation. In fact, one of the guy on the previous slide, his name is Wolchek had an explanation for this, and you got the Nobel Prize for it. What an idea. Is, uh, the idea is called um, 
asymptotic freedom. It's the notion that these quarks are bound so strongly together that the harder you pull, the harder they pull, and they want to stay together. In other words, you can't extract a quark out of a proton. Bummer. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but I, when I was a kid, you would tell me, you can't do this. And I would say, maybe, yes, I can. And I would try. Well, this is particularly hard. So how do you take quarks in a proton, in a neutron, and separate them? Well, I just told you you can't. And now I'm going to tell you you actually can. To, to show you this, I have a problem with this technology here. Yeah, there we go. All right, this is a somewhat obscure, and I realize this is a big room. Probably you can't read this, so I'll, I'll say the words. Somebody in the 70s realized that actually we could separate quarks from one another if we were to supply enough heat and enough density. Actually, we'll check had something to do with that. So, so came the notion of, okay, um, I can't take a proton and break it apart, but maybe if I smash a bunch of protons together and I produce matter that has enough uh, temperature and density, maybe I can actually produce quarks that are separable or separated, and we say deconfined. So this became a goal in the late 70s, and it became a goal in the 80s, and people tried. They built accelerators in Berkeley, in, in New York, um, uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, they built that, uh, accelerators at CERN in Switzerland. So 80s, didn't work. 90s, didn't work. I finished my PhD in 1987, and I became involved at Brookhaven, and the goal right there was to, to do this. So from 1987 to 2000, we tried and tried and tried, and we didn't, didn't work. And sometimes it's not because you don't have the will, it's perhaps sometimes it's because you don't have the technology. And in fact, in this case, we didn't have the technology. But thanks to your tax dollars, or maybe it's those of your parents, um, we were able to build this complex. This is at Brookhaven National Lab, Long Island, New York. This is a large complex of accelerators, and this machine was then, in 2000, uh, capable of producing the highest beam, uh, energy beam, uh, possible uh, then. Uh, it was, and so what we did, a bunch of friends and I, other geeks, <laughs> uh, we built this detector, and other folks built a few other detectors. So overall, there were four detectors around uh, this collider, as we call it. So this is a, a, not just an accelerator, it's actually two accelerators in one, and the beams collide, uh, you have a beam one going one way, you have a beam going another way, and at four spots they actually cross and collide. What were the beams? Gold nuclei beams. And these beams were traveling at 99.999, I forget, percent of the speed of light. In fact, the, the speed of these beams is so large that we, uh, we don't actually talk of the speed, we actually talk about the energy of the beams. And in this case, the energy was 200 GeV per nucleon. Don't worry about the number. It's high, it's a big number. And so we actually uh, started and studied collisions and collisions and collisions. And let me give you a cartoon of what a collision looked like. Of course, I mean, you can't see a collision like this. The size of a nucleus is too small. But in a, in a nutshell, this is what we see. You have, this is what happens, rather. So you have two nuclei, they're traveling nearly the speed of light, they collide, and as they penetrate one another, they nearly stop. And all that energy of motion, all that kinetic energy, is almost instantly transformed into making thousands of particles. And I really literally mean thousands of particles. In one single collision of nuclei, of lead nuclei, we produce 5,000 particles called pions and kaons. Okay, so what does it have to do with the perfect liquid? Here it comes. One way to look at this is to see exactly 
what happens right after the collision. So you have two nuclei and they're zooming by at this incredible speed. And sometimes they touch, sometimes they have a head-on collision. Here it's sort of an in-between. And so you have two blue blobs. Those are the protons and neutrons that didn't touch, didn't interact. And then you have the blob in the middle. That's where the stuff actually stopped, nearly stopped. And that blob reaches a temperature of about a trillion degrees. A trillion degrees. That's a million times the temperature of the sun in its core. So there's no other way on Earth to produce this kind of temperature. And it wasn't until we could produce this temperature in, the, in these collisions that we could actually achieve a quark gluon plasma. So a quark gluon plasma is this matter where the quarks are actually traveling free from one another. And you see the size. It's, this is very small. And the duration of this sort of thing is 10 to the minus 22 seconds. And so it's very fast. Now, this blob, as you can see, it has sort of an almond shape. So you, you pump a huge amount of energy in this blob, and there's nothing around it to confine it. So it's going to explode. But it's not symmetric, so it's going to explode in asymmetric way. So what we do, we measure the particles it produced, and we measure the pattern of emission of those particles. And from that, we characterize the pattern. And so I'll show you one plot. I'm a scientist, I have to do this, you know. So we characterize the pattern of the particles produced by this variable that we call V2. And effectively, it means that stuff is flowing in one direction. And we plot it here as a function of the momentum of the particle, the speed of the particle, if you will. And what we find is that it's huge. It's a huge quantity. And we, in 2000, we didn't, uh, in, 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 the, in the 90s, we didn't think it would be that large. But it is. And so um, I'm an experimentalist. My theoretical friends started scratching their head and trying to figure out models and how to understand this. And they came up with models. And you hear you have data and you have models, and the agreement is so good that you can't, from the back of the room, certainly, you can't see the difference. Well, there's a small difference. The models are not perfect. But the models actually work. And so let me tell you about the model. The model assumes that this stuff that we made the stuff that lasts for about 10 to the minus 22 seconds um, is, is like a liquid, a liquid of quarks and gluons. And this liquid is very, very strongly interacting. It carries a lot of energy, and it's, the forces involved are enormous. Yet, this liquid is almost like a f free of viscosity, no friction, almost as if this, this stuff flows as if there was no friction whatsoever. Now, think about it. This is amazing. This is something which is amazingly hot, a trillion degrees, and it, it flows like there's nothing to, to slow it down. So we actually do models now, and we get better at this, and now we find out that it's actually not zero viscosity, but it's almost zero viscosity, and so it's almost a perfect liquid. And so that was the goal of my story to tell you about the perfect liquid. Um, now, how perfect is the liquid? Well, here's another graph. You can compare this liquid, the viscosity of this liquid, to that of water. You can compare it to that of air. You can compare it to that of other very good liquids, such as superfluid helium. And what you find out is it beats them all. This liquid is really, really uh, uh, viscous, almost viscous free. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool uh, liquid. So, um, and we made the news with this. Um, so uh, we're not done. Uh, now we have a new toy. We have a new machine, also paid with your tax dollar. Please don't stop. <laughs> don't reduce taxes. So this, this new machine is at CERN. This is a picture um, taken near Geneva. Uh, you can not see this new machine, the Large Hadron Collider, but it's under the, the, the white line. And uh, this machine is located 150 meters on the ground. And it's capable of accelerating protons to energies that were unprecedented. So we, we can do 
uh, fabulous things with this. And uh, at Wayne State, we have actually two groups of faculty involved in this machine. Uh, one, invo one group uh, involved with the CMS experiment, one of the largest experiments ever built, and one group uh, with this experiment. This is a cutaway view of the detector uh, called the ALICE experiment. So two groups involved in this uh, fabulous enterprise, uh, which is called the Large Hadron Collider. And I, I should stress that the Large Hadron Collider is probably the largest piece of machinery ever built by human beings. Okay. So, so what does it have to do with big ideas? So I'm going to go over time. I hope you will forgive me uh, one minute. Let me show you this picture. This is a picture where the perfect fluid sits right at the beginning. This is a picture that scientists have now, over, working over the last 60 years, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists. This is a picture that we now formulate to put ourselves in the big, con in the context of, of the universe. This picture says, and I, I can't go in any detail here because I'm, over, uh, I'm a few minutes over time already, but in this picture we know that, and we can actually measure precisely that the universe started 13.7 billion years ago, and following a uh, rapid expansion there was a, a time uh, where this perfect fluid that I talked about existed for about a microsecond. And then after that, more stuff happened, and nucleosynthesis, and, and all the stuff that we have, all, all the elements we have around us were, were synthesized in stars. I could go on and on and on. I, I don't have time. The point I want to make here is my big idea. Through science, through studies of the world, we learn things about the world, and these things are extremely important. It is often said that Science is about the how in life. How does this work? How do you make it? How is this, you know, how does the car work? I want to challenge this notion. I want to challenge this view. I want to tell you that science it can also be about the why. And why am I saying this? Because from where we are today, we can unravel history going all the way back to the beginning of time. We can understand the origin of life. We can understand the origin of our planet, the origin of our sun, the origin of our solar system, our galaxy, all the way back to time. I don't think there's a bigger idea than this. Understanding where we come from, what we are. And so, yes, I think it's important in the context of Detroit to understand, to, to figure out what we can do in Detroit to, to make it a better city. But please, don't lose sight of this very important thing that we also, through studies, by going to school, by studying, by uh, studying nature, we can have a better understanding of who we are and where we, uh, where we come from. And I think that's a very important thing, thing to do. Thank you.